What's going on, everybody? Welcome to a special edition of Notable Releases. Uh, normally, we talk about video games here, uh, but today, we're actually going to talk about some music. Um, if you read my article on the avocado, uh, the-avocado.org, every Tuesday, new game releases, <laughs> you'll know that I talk about uh, three older titles from 10, 20, and 30 years ago. Um, I will also cover notable albums and notable mu uh, movies that have come out uh, the same time as these games. So our notable album from 2014 is Restoring Force by Of Mice and Men. And uh, uh, I'm lucky enough to know the drummer, uh, Valentino Artiega, or Tino, as I, uh, we called him when we were younger. Um, we were in a band together uh, for a little bit when he was a teenager. Um, and, and now he's this big rock star. It's amazing. So we're going to talk to him about Restoring Force, what it was like to uh, make that album, what it did for the band itself, um, and just kind of uh, where they're at now, and the, the lessons he learned making it and how he applies it to his music today. Um, so anyway, here we go. Uh, what's going on, everybody? I am talking with uh, Tino, or, or Valentino, I don't know. What, what do you like to go by? You, you can call me Tino. That's cool. All right. I can call him Tino. Yeah. <laughs> You're the homie. I don't know about the rest of you. This guy yeah. can call him Tino. So, no, I just play. Well, well hey. we've known each other now going on over 20 years. Yeah, it's been that long. I was just talking with the other guys. I was like, I, I think we've known Tino, yeah, since at least 2000, 2001, something like that. Yeah. How old were you um, when we first met? Do you remember? Probably like 14, I think. Wow. Yeah, freshman, or maybe... I, it had to have been freshman in high school. So yeah, about 14 or 15. So, um, well, so we're talking right now. It's the 10 year anniversary of Restoring Force. Um, kind of your, would you call this your breakthrough album? Was this what kind of got you guys into the mainstream? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there were some like six singles, and, like five music videos made for this. That was. Yeah, it was a, it was a very, very uh, hefty undertaking at the time for a band that I guess we up until this album, we didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> we were just kind of writing songs and doing our thing. And, and it wasn't until this album that I feel like we really not only broke through to the mainstream, but also broke through in a way for us as musicians, learning how and working with an incredible producer to be able mm -hmm. to create uh, music that has... <laughs> warranted a celebration 10 years later <laughs> yeah yeah it's not often that you can you can go back and look at something you've made and and really kind of you know focus in on it and you guys are still going it's not like this came out and you were gone i mean you still got albums you just had an album come out last year right yeah our, our eighth studio album that's nuts yeah man it's super crazy and <laughs> i i really i think it's really um a testament to this record that really helped cement us not only like i said uh in the mainstream but as musicians to be able to continue for this long and mm -hmm. continue to challenge ourselves we still reference things that we did in the studio during this recording session specifically in our albums you know probably forever you know yeah. it's it's something the privilege of getting to work with an incredible producer mm -hmm. and having um that experience to be able to reference upon at any point in your life, I think, as a musician is uh, something that's super powerful. Yeah. So um, you, you mentioned the producer. Was it um, David Bendeth? Yep. Okay. So, I mean, he's working with bands like Paramore and Bring Me the Horizon, Day to Remember. What was the, how did that relationship form and, and why, or why choose him or, or was that a studio decision or not a, a label decision or how did that come about? Um, I feel like he had kind of like sought us out a little bit at the time we were looking for producers to produce our third album. Mm -hmm. And when his name came up, we had all like really known him from specifically Paramore Riot yeah. because those myself, especially because those drum tones were pretty iconic for the time for how powerful they were. And I felt like what an incredible opportunity it could be to work with somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And then not to mention his knowledge of metal in working with Breaking Benjamin and um, producing a lot of their first records, which had massive radio success. 
Sure. I don't think we went into it thinking we would even get on the radio, but <laughs> it was kind of like, a, well, if we want to go to the next level, we should work with the producer who's going to challenge our ideas and sort of show us how the big dogs do it. Because up until that point, we had only worked with um, the producer, Joey Sturgis, who predominantly made um, metalcore or scenecore or sure. screamo records where we kind of wanted to see, well, what would happen if we worked with somebody that didn't really make those records? What would our music sound like working with somebody who worked with uh, a much more of a yeah. mainstream um, musical audience? So that kind of happened like, it, it was just kind of like a right place, right time. Mm -hmm. We never thought he would be put in the mix. And when he was, it was just like, oh, no brainer. We have to because yeah. we didn't think that it would get to we'd get to record with somebody at that caliber. Right. An opportunity like that comes along. You definitely want to like. Yeah, I think he just sure. I think he had just won a Grammy for the Elvis rem remixes and masters, too. So okay. it was just like it was some pretty <laughs> gnarly stuff where we're just like, oh, my God, like, nice. are we even worthy of this? Like, what's going to happen, you know? <laughs> Yeah, uh, you you had mentioned that this was kind of like a um, like a change of, of of pace for the banner, or a different. Maybe you're going for a different sound, or something. Maybe trying to grow up. Was that yeah. so? Was that conscious, or was it just kind of like a, a natural evolution of like, okay, we're getting older, we're maturing as as artists. We want to we want to see what we can do next. Like how? Why um, it was kind of more of uh, we weren't. <laughs> I wouldn't say <laughs> that we were like mature then. You know, I sure. feel like we were still very starry eyed and um, enamored with the idea of what would the band sound like if we worked with somebody that we didn't expect to get to work with, you know, if mm -hmm. we were going to go back and do another record with um, Joey Sturgis, which was kind of the, the talk at the time, we kind of knew what to expect from that. So this was a bit of a left field, like, Oh wow, this is a really cool opportunity. Let's take it and let's see where it goes. Yeah album's about to you're getting ready to record the album okay uh, you know you've just caught off your second album the flood what um when did the songwriting process start for restoring force what um you know what were you trying to say with this album that maybe you didn't in the previous albums or that you wanted to continue saying right well it kind of began with we had a lot of um like calls with him while we were on tour talking about the album and really, uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head with that. He, his big thing was, is what, what are you guys trying to say? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what is the message that you're trying to put out with your music? And we had never really thought of it that way because it was more of like in the past when we were writing music, it would be like crafting parts and this part's cool and this is cool. And here's a cool like line um uh, sure and here's a cool Everyone's lyric and here's gear. this and <laughs> this could go on a t-shirt you know yeah. like this is this, this is, it was it was a lot more like not thinking too too hard about the importance of or the staying power of the music but it was more so um he, he really wanted us to challenge those ideas and it was our first record with um our new singer at the time aaron yes. polly and um, we had heard some of the music that he had made in the past, which was why um, he was inducted into the band before that, because we were really, really impressed with not only his vocal delivery, but also his depth in um, lyric writing. Yeah. And uh, he's a very um, well-spoken man, if I say so myself. <laughs> and he continues to really impress me, too, uh, on our yeah. eighth album. Like, I'm just like, oh, my God, dude, how, right. how do you come up with this stuff? I mean, but at the time it was very new. And so we mm -hmm. were like, wow, you know, we, we really need to utilize this and uh, figure out how to implement him in a way that solidifies a new sound for the band. After going through some member changes and stuff at that time, we were like, we want to make the most impactful music. And David Bendith was there saying basically the same thing. So it started with a lot of like brainstorming and stuff like that over the phone and then we went into the studio uh, in between tours for, I believe, like two weeks to kind of get some pre-pro, see how things go, any riffs, any ideas. He had a massive studio. It was Whitney Houston's old personal studio oh, wow. out in New Jersey. Um, 
And cool. so it had multiple rooms. So we had areas to be able to work on our music individually, to be able to come up with ideas, to get in the in the main room and jam and kind of work everything out. And um, it was in those first like two weeks that we kind of like, okay, we want it to be heavy. We want it to be melodic. Uh, we want big choruses. You know, that's something that mm -hmm. I feel like our band has always done. It's like mixing the heaviness with the melody and creating something like yeah. super impactful. And um, yeah. And so that's kind of how it came about. And then uh, we went on tour and then we booked out three months ish studio time to get in and start to grind out the songs. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so in that process, songs went from, you know, demo version to being scrapped to, can we play it live? What does it sound like if we play it live, let's get in a circle and, and work together and what goes better after this and, and really having, um, Bendith there to help, help us kind of like, um, maximize the intent of the music whereas before it was a lot more like let's throw together these parts at the time we were still kind of doing that and he was like yeah well you're you're losing the listener you know like rein it in figure figure out this okay. do that um i specifically remember coming in i've always had a very um bombastic style of drumming very <laughs> technical I, sure. I had done you know, we had done two records before that, and I had done one record with my other band, Lower Definition, from San Diego. Yeah. And I had never really been reined in as a drummer. It was always like, okay, Tino, record your drum parts, kill it, do your thing, and we'll figure it out. And I, I specifically remember many times he would be like, why would you play that? You're overshadowing the vocals. They can't mm -hmm. hear the riff. You're going too crazy. Like, dial it back. And I think I had... Okay. That was news to me. I was like, yeah. oh, well, I thought all my favorite drummers go crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. I didn't know that there was like a method to this. And he yeah, was like, no, I'm to the craziness, you know? Right, right, right. And so he was like, he was like, no, well, what, what your drumming needs to do is it needs to service the song. You need to mm -hmm. provide the backbone, the rhythm for the song. And if that means saving your explosive parts for those explosive moments, and not going so crazy all of the time yeah. was uh, something that I hadn't really heard before. And it was challenging at first. I got to say it. Yeah. We called it the Bendith boot camp, <laughs> And, uh, and he was, you know, he was pretty hard on us, but for, but for good reason, you know, right. we needed to be challenged. We needed to learn what it meant to craft a song, you know, sure. and, and, a, and a song in most ways is very formulaic. You know what I mean? Especially if it's going to be on the radio, especially if it's going to translate into the mainstream at the time, uh, maybe not so much now. I feel like now a lot of mainstream music can be a little bit left of center and uh, the, the less formulaic can be a little more exciting. But at the time back in, you know, 24, well, I guess it was 2013 when we were recording it. Yeah. Uh, it was a lot more, there needed to be formula. There needed to be strategy behind what it was we were writing. And so that was something that he really injected into it. It wasn't really like, Oh, play this or play that. It was more of like, why are you playing this? Try this, try doing something dialed back, try doing something where when the chorus comes, it can become a more explosive moment instead of just go, 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 which is kind of how we had written before because in our in our minds we were writing for what we grew up with which was rowdy mosh pit club sure. shows and stuff like that and he was like if you want to see yourselves in arenas and you want to play bigger venues you need to allow the music to breathe you need to allow the music to be able to fill the rooms that you hope to play and mm -hmm. let the audience and let the let the lyric and let the music do the rest and that was, again, like I said, it's just, this was so foreign to us that we were sure. like, wow, I, I, this is why we're coming to you <laughs> to help us with this because we wouldn't think of that normally. Right. And that, I think that's, that's part of the, like, when I was talking earlier about kind of maturing in your art is, is finding somebody right. who's going to make you, uh, do better as an artist, um, as opposed to, like you said, just kind of doing what you're always 
used to. And it can be scary to change, but I mean, obviously, uh, this worked out for you guys very well, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you had mentioned that this was uh, Aaron Pauly's first album with you guys. Um, uh, you liked his work before. Do you remember kind of his first day with the band and writing? Do you remember what, like, did he bring something to you, like, immediately that was like, here, check this out, and you just fucking started playing something? Yeah, or... totally. I mean, at, at the time, um, <laughs> he actually lied to us and said that he was, <laughs> that he could play bass. Oh, and okay. He hadn't ever really played bass. He was an incredible guitar player. Uh -huh. And when we had saw him, we, we, we played a show with him in his um, other band, Jamie's Elsewhere. And um, we were floored by his singing. And when I asked him to cut us like a, um, like a demo reel, and he yeah. sent me a 12 minute demo reel of everything from R and B to metalcore riff to rock song to everything. It, it just, it had everything. And we were like, wow. And he's like, and I can play the guitar and I play the bass. And it was actually the first, he said it was like one of the first times that he had ever even picked up a bass, recorded the bass. He was just that <laughs> determined to nail it. And and yeah. man, he did. But a lot of, a lot of what um, he brought to the table was another, another mind behind the riffs of being able to create and to be able to have um, uh, a different musical knowledge and musical influence that brought um, a lot to the table. And, and we mm -hmm. didn't realize that at the time, you know, we were just like, Oh, he's a singer. And, he can yeah. play bass and it's going to be sick and he's a great person to have around. And, uh, and it ended up that um, he brought a lot to the table um, during that session. And I think it was because though it was challenging with Bendith, it was comfortable because he allowed everyone to have a voice mm -hmm. and there was no bad ideas. There was just ideas that hadn't been tried. Yeah. So it was something like where he kind of opened the floor for everybody to come in and try things and see what worked. And if you have a better idea, let's do it. And if you don't like something, but you don't have a better idea, well, you don't get a say because unless you're going to bring something new to the table or tr challenge the idea with another idea, then, you know, this is the best idea we have so far. So yeah, it was, it, yeah, like I said, I mean, it was such an interesting experience because in the past recording, it, it was a lot more, I guess, relaxed in comfortability working with joey uh on the on the first two records because we knew what to expect we knew what his style was and so working with david that was a lot more of like a oh wow this is this is cool it kind of sucks at times because it's hard but mm -hmm. it's worth it in the end were you at all worried um because you know you, you were kind of changing up the style going a little i don't want to call it pop or whatever but it was a little more radio friendly i guess was there any worry that that old fans would maybe kind of you know flip you guys off and or, or yeah yeah to, to a certain extent i think that's always that's always kind of uh in the back of our minds when we're trying to push the envelope with what we're writing uh and that was you know one of the first times that i feel like we had kind of um actively thought that because we were like wow a lot of this stuff's different like a song like our our lead track which was you're not alone mm -hmm. was uh almost like a like a ACDC kind of like hell's bells type vibe that we yeah. were like, it's a man, starter. bands like us don't really do this, but like, <laughs> we're a band like us. So why not, you know, like right. why not have a very driving four on the floor, you know, real rock song. And, and there was, I swear, dude, there was a point at, like up until that point, I swore that I would never play four on the floor. I was like, <laughs> I am not that drummer. I, I, I like, I like to play too much. I like to overplay, you know? Yeah. So I was like, I'll never do four on the floor. And I ate my words on that. And I love that song still to this day. You know, I think there's, there's definitely a power behind laying a, like a really solid backbeat mm -hmm. like that. And, and, and I feel like um, with the online discourse and stuff like that, that was always going to happen, you know? Yeah. And we tried not to let it get to us too much because as that happens, it, it's kind of always what's going to happen. And I felt like because we were kind of at around that time was where social media was really starting to take off. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of early on that we were like, don't read the comments. Don't worry about what other people <laughs> are saying, like focus on what you're doing because what you're, what we were doing was 
it was intentional, you know, it was something that we felt like was powerful. And it's, it's easy to be in a studio with no windows in a box bunker style thing where you're just like, don't let out, don't let in any outside influence. Like this is us. Like we're making what we want to make and we're having fun doing it and it feels great. Let's just chase that and try not to have any um, outside too much of the outside input of things that you're not going to make everyone happy with yeah. what you make. You know, art is subjective. Art is something that will be perceived differently from everybody who listens to it and, or looks at it or is exposed to it. So I think that was, that was, we were in, in the middle of realizing that with social media and with everything that we were just like, you know what, we're strong on this. We feel like these are really well-crafted songs and it's something that we've never done before. And so why not just go all in, you know, yeah. and commit, commit to the songs. Absolutely. Um, okay. So done with the recording album comes out, uh, big success. I think it was uh number four in the billboard top 200. It was like the number one independent. What's that? Oh, that was, that was, that was, that was crazy. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. didn't, we did not expect that at all. And that yeah. was like, uh, you know, even, even in the past, like, bands like us like uh that, that are in the alternative realm especially mm -hmm. at that time um from kind of like what you might call the warp tour world sure um that just kind of didn't happen you know and so for us we were like oh my god like we just we just beat beyonce like what <laughs> like number four like that that's somebody needs to recheck those numbers right and um yeah it was it was just crazy you know we were we were riding a a crazy train at that point and we were like wow this it the the juice was definitely worth the squeeze by being in the studio and challenging ourselves to do that yeah. and then to see the response was huge you know and it was something that um you know was extremely like mind-blowing for us at the time still i mean still mind-blowing um did that change did that happen overnight like, was it an overnight thing where it was like one day you were here playing a small club and then the next day you guys are on a giant festival somewhere in, in Germany or something? Um, I feel like we, we could kind of see it, see it. And the only thing that we could gauge at this point was because we were playing warp tour every summer. Mm -hmm. So the warp tour before that, um, 2012, we were kind of seeing like, wow, there's, we're getting pretty big crowds like this is mm -hmm. pretty insane and and we hadn't even recorded the album yet were you on the main so, stage at that point or were you still kind of on the side stage yeah we were on main stage at that okay. um on 2012 and so we were wow like a lot of people are listening to this like we need to make uh we need to make a an important record you know this is an important mm -hmm. record not only for the band but we kind of felt like coming from that world coming from you know, metalcore, scenecore, screamo, whatever. It was just something that we were like, wow, we're doing something that feels like it's bigger than anything that we could imagine. And we want to be able to take that to the next level. So when the album came out uh, and we had, we had started doing the lead singles uh, in 2013, and then the album comes out 2014, we were kind of seeing by the response, like, wow, this is gaining a lot of momentum uh -huh. real fast, you know, and, and, no matter what first week numbers, even to this day, or, you know, for pop artists and for mainstream artists, it's still a huge, a huge thing. I feel like not so much an alternative anymore because it's kind of more about the music and the shows and whatnot. Sure. But um, yeah. So at that time we were just like, Oh my God, this is crazy. You know, we <laughs> couldn't believe it. Um, touring. You guys went on tour with, uh, well, who was it? Uh, Bring me the horizon right after that and then kind of did like a European and Latin America tour work tour after that do you have any fun kind of tour memories touring this album after it after it came out yeah absolutely I mean it was a really cool time to tour with bring me the horizon because they had just released their pivotal album Sempaternal as well okay. and we were big fans of that and it just felt like both our bands were really like steamrolling in the scene and and in the uh, magazines and all kinds of stuff like the talk was about all of that happening and so as far as the tour stories go i mean it it was just a big um a big celebration you know every night when the shows were the it was this tour 
right here, the American Dream Tour. Yeah. I have the poster and uh, yeah, it was fully sold out. And we were just like, wow, this is a, we're riding a wave right now. Like this yeah. is crazy. We had never really felt like that before. And um, to be able to share that with um, the bringing the horizon guys was really cool. And we've stayed friends since then. And, you know, it's cool to see those moments happen in real time. And mm -hmm. it's something that you can't really, um, you can't really plan for you just kind of have to take it all in and enjoy every moment. And we really did, you know, it was, it was crazy getting to do in-store signings with just <laughs> crowds outside and, sure. you know, lines down the street at hot topic and, you know, places that I've been my whole life. <laughs> right. Yeah. Where I would have never come to something like this. There's like way too many people here. This is insane. <laughs> like I, I had never, I had never experienced anything like that. And, right. um, I feel like it was something that was, you know, really powerful and and it and it made us realize how incredible music and the counterculture of the underground scene and the um the fervor of the fans and everything like it was just an uh, an amazing time to just kind of be out there and just being experiencing it and living in the moment and not really being able to think, "Oh, what's next? What are we going to do?" It was just like wow, we did this. Let's go, you know, like, right. let's do Just everything. Let's go everywhere. Movie. Yeah, totally. Right on. Do you have any, um, do you remember like any memorable fan interactions you had back then? Was there anybody who, who sticks out or? Um, yeah. Out? I mean, we would get so much fan art, man. Like our oh, fans wow. would like draw us and like make incredible, incredible, like lifelike drawings of us and do paintings and, being an artist myself, I, I feel like that that always really stuck with me that um, fans would go that extra mile to spend hours, if not days, painting something or, or you know, creating something for us mm -hmm. that was like, you know, very personal, like a photo of me or, or like a photo of the guys or re recreate a photo of us live on stage or something like that. And um, just kind of seeing how that crossover happened was really cool you know it, it really felt like because we never really felt like and we still don't but the, in our minds there's not like a celebrity status that comes with mm -hmm. being a musician like we're just musicians yeah. we're just making music so yeah. to kind of have that where fans are like you know lining up and painting us and doing all kinds of stuff and we're signing everything of theirs like it was just the, the whole thing was um just like a next level fandom that really felt very special. And, and I feel like because of the lyrics, because of what our band talks about, which is like everything from hope to hopelessness and uh, you know, trying to feel on top of the world, but then also feeling at the very bottom sometimes. And, and we've yeah. always kind of written about the human experience and human emotions. And I think at that time, and still to this day, it really connects with an audience that maybe mainstream music doesn't sing to. Mm -hmm. And it's mainstream music doesn't really tap into that feeling. And I feel like because of that, all of our favorite artists growing up had that, you know, they, 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 they talked about that. And I felt like us doing that was kind of like a pushing, pushing the envelope further to be able to usher that in for the next you know uh realm of fans and the next realm of um what was you know to come next with albums and everything like that and yeah uh, yeah. yeah it was just really cool right on so we only got a little bit of time left i know you, we gotta you gotta run but um so uh what did this album do to to further your guys's kind of career like what um what what came next and what is coming next for you guys oh thank you um yeah, I feel like, um, again, it kind of goes back to the creation of the record. You know, it really, it it helped teach us how to write music with more thought than just like, oh, this part's cool, this part's cool, this part's cool. Mm -hmm. We still have that, but I think um, understanding um, the radio aspect and understanding a more uh, digestible style of music was something that kind of helped balance and and actually the name restoring force was about bringing balance and 
uh, the restoring force in an equilibrium is the force that inertia gets when it gets to the side of one and it comes back to mm. where it gets back to normal. Yeah. And I feel like that that is kind of a, a big thing that we took into account during that time. And and since then, like I said, even to this day, we still reference some of those sessions and we still reference some of those one-liners that Bendith was <laughs> so classic for saying. But it, it really is something that has stuck with us through that time. And Do you have a favorite Bendith uh, one-liner? Uh... I mean, the one that always sticks out to me is a drummer wouldn't play that, <laughs> which kind of goes back to the technicality of what I was trying to throw in. And uh, I dig the challenge, though, you know, and yeah. I feel like a music, playing music and creating music is a journey. And it's something that it's never ending. And that's something that's cool about um, getting to work with people like that is they'll challenge your ideas and they'll make you think outside of the box or outside of whatever your comfort zone is. And, mm -hmm. um, and so we still try and do that to this day, no matter what, what it is we're doing, that if it feels comfortable, let's challenge it. Let's do something different. Right and I think as we're now working on our ninth album, it's like, how are we going to do that? Well, the only way to do it is to start, you know, throwing ideas out there and then challenging those ideas and trying mm -hmm. to up the musicianship and elevate the performances and elevate the thought behind it and dig deeper, not only within ourselves, but in the music and what we are putting out there to be able to allow there to be um, a deeper layer of insight to the music not to take things for face value and we've never really been fans of like face value um not i, I hate to say it like bubblegum pop or whatever sure. you know because a lot of that is very deep too a lot of that i don't want to mm -hmm. discredit some of the artists that write stuff like that but mm -hmm. it's definitely not a it it's it's something that i feel like our music uh with every album we want it to be more dense. We want sure. it to be, we want it to have more layers. And especially now that we have, we've had the opportunity to be able to make so many albums that we realize that a lot of bands don't get that opportunity. And so for us, we just feel grateful that the fans have stuck with us through all the years and are continuing to uh, download and stream and order the, order the vinyl and do everything like that. It's just a, a, a really cool experience that I think, uh, we definitely do not take for granted, and it's something that we're going to continue to to push the envelope and push ourselves um, into the future. And we don't know what the future holds, but all we know is as we go through life, we have to write this music. You know, this music is kind of a, th a, a bit of a th therapeutic thing for us. And then to be able to go out and perform it live for our fans and for audiences around the world, seeing them connect with it in real time while we're performing it is just that synergy is something that I money can't buy that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that, that's just something that's something otherworldly that is the beauty of being able to share art with other people and seeing it resonate and vibrate with people in that way, I think is, is something that we're always going to continue to do. Right on. Um, well, Tino, thank you so much. Of course, man. Thank for, you. Uh, talking with me. I appreciate great, it. Great talking about this album uh what, what what what's that what's that second song bones exposed fucking great yep song. banger um, love it uh okay i i think what do we got it says four minutes left on on this okay uh any 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 last words anything you want to say we were in a band together for a hot minute when we were yep. when we were kids yeah um yeah i like saying, girls David? man i like girls so what much fun dude. Band, huh? dude still some of my favorite times man <laughs> i i think it's so cool that we're able to reconnect on this uh on this journey in life yeah and um you know i you guys were the first band that i got to play in with in front of a a pretty formidable sized audience you know and yeah, it's something we that played in an ice rink one time yep we played in an <laughs> ice rink we played at the iconic canes bar and grill uh -huh. just java oh, you know man, what i mean just like, java. Just... everyone online knows about just java yeah <laughs> Chula Vista. You know, just Java. Yeah, totally. Um, no, and and I, th I just think that's so cool, man. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk about one of my albums. And dude, it, it's a good album. If, yeah, if, thank you so if, much. If you listen to it out there. Go listen to this album, Restoring Force. You're gonna love it. I promise.
Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, yeah keep listening. Um, that's a, in, uh, a wonderful time in my life that was really a gateway into, you know, making music that I feel like, um, it, it helped, it helped, uh, kindle that passion, you know, and I feel mm -hmm. like it's something that I've always had, but it's moments like those that, that are really, um, meaningful and, and powerful. And yeah. I think that, uh, it's something, like I said, that we still take to this day and we still reference to this day and we appreciate all the fans for listening and still, you know, supporting it. Would you still be there? Just went gold last year. So we got a gold record for that. And I mean, it's just, it's only possible. It's only made possible because of the fans and because of our audience. And really that's the whole reason why we're still doing this because we still really and truly feel that connection with them and uh, not only owe it to ourselves, but owe it to them to continue and to dig deep and continue to write meaningful music. I want to thank Tino once again for uh, taking this time to hang out with me over the internet. Great guy. Uh, uh, can't uh, say enough nice things about Tino. Um, he was a, a good kid back then. He's a good guy now. Um, like I said, Restoring Force, this is a great album. Loved it from top to bottom. The song, uh, what was it, Bones? I got it right here in front of me. I'm a huge fan, as you can tell. <laughs> Bones, ex Bones Exposed. Fucking great song. I I can listen to Bones Exposed. I have been listening to it on repeat for the last couple days. Great song. Anyways, Tino, again, thank you. Folks, thank you for watching at home. And, uh... We'll see you next time. Bye.